The Senate will come to order. Mr. Carpenter, please call the roll. Senators Bridges. Bridges. Bridges, Cook, Quorum, Court, Crowder, Crowder, Danielson, Donovan. Finberg, Fields, Foot, Gardner, Janal, Gonzalez, Gonzalez, Hill, Heisey, Hobart, Lee, Blundine, Marble, Marble, Moreno, Patterson, Brioa, Rankin, Rodriguez, Scott, Smallwood, Sonnenberg, Story, Tate, Todd, Todd, Williams, Winter, Woodward, Zenzinger, Mr. President. Here. With 35 present, zero absent, zero excuse, we have a quorum. Senator Story, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, colleagues, would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Approval of the journal. Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the reading of the journal for Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019 be dispensed with and that the journal be approved as corrected by the secretary. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the motion is adopted. <laughs> Committee reports. April 2nd, 2019, the Committee on Local Government is having consideration. I had on the final appointment circumstances and appointments to be placed on the consent calendar firm members of the State Housing Board for terms expiring January 31st, 2023. And Theodore Martin of Denver, Colorado, to serve as Democrat resident of the 1st Congressional District, reappointed. Brian Arnold of Aurora, Colorado, an unaffiliated member and resident of the 6th Congressional District, appointed. Raymond Timothy Hudner of Grand Junction, Colorado, Republican resident of the 3rd Congressional District, reappointed. April 2nd, 2019, Committee of Local Government, after consideration of Mary's Committee, is following. Senate Bill 200, be referred to Committee Whole, a favorable recommendation recommendation placed on the consent calendar. April 2nd, 2019, Committee of Local Government, after consideration of Mary's Committee, is following. House Bill 1087, be referred to Committee Whole, the favorable recommendation recommendation placed on the consent calendar. April 2nd, 2019, Committee of Local Government, after consideration of Mary's Committee, is following. House Bill 1213, be referred to Committee Whole, the favorable recommendation. April 2nd, 2019, Committee on Finance, after consideration of Mary's Committee, is following. Senate Bill 192, be amended as follows. Also amended, be referred to Committee on Appropriations, the favorable recommendation. April 2nd, 2019, Committee on Finance, after consideration of Mary's Committee, is following. Senate Bill 197, be referred to Favorable Committee on Appropriations. April 2nd, 2019, Committee on Finance, after consideration of Mary's Committee, is following. Senate Bill 157, be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations, April 2nd, 2019, Committee on Finance, after consideration of Merits Committee is following. Senate Bill 153, be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations, 
April 2nd, 2019, Committee on Transportation and Energy, African Consideration Marriage Committee, Rex Falling, House Bill 1207, be amended as follows. SMN be referred to Committee of Whole. The favorable recommendation recommendation be placed on the consent calendar. Senate Services. Quick with printed, Senate Bill 230, 231, 232, and 233 correctly, and gross Senate Bill 4, 166, 167, Senate Resolution 8 and 9 correctly revised, House Bill 1038, 1069, 1150, 1172 correctly enrolled, Senate Bill 141, Senate Resolution 8. Introduction of resolutions. Mr. Majority Leader. Mr. Carpenter, please proceed. Senate General Resolution 7 by Senator Moreno, Representative Crabthorp, concerning designating the first full week of May as Tardive Dyskinesia Awareness Week. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I move Senate Joint Resolution 007 to lay over uh, until April 9th. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and Senate Joint Resolution 007 will be laid over until Tuesday, April 9th. <laughs> Introduction of bills. House Bill 1090 by Representatives Graham Van Winkle and Senators Gonzalez and Hill concerning measures to allow greater investment flexibility in marijuana businesses in connection with making an appropriation. Finance and appropriations. Third reading of bills, consent. Mr. Carpenter, please read the titles to all the bills listed on the consent calendar. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. There has been a request to remove House Bill 1150 from the consent calendar. House Bill 1150 will be removed from the consent calendar. Mr. Carpenter, please read the titles to all the bills listed on the consent calendar. House Bill 1038 by Representative Duran Alantine, Senator General and Story, concerning dental services for pregnant women covered under the Children's Basic Health Plan and in connection with making an appropriation. House Bill 1069 by Representative Jackson and Senator Danielson, concerning the certification of sign language interpreters for the purpose of title protection and in connection with making an appropriation. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move the passage of all the bills on the third reading of bills consent calendar, which includes House Bill 1038 and House Bill 1069. Is there any discussion on any of the bills? Seeing none, the motion is the passage of all the bills listed on the third reading consent calendar. Are there any no votes on any of the bills on the third reading consent calendar? With a vote of 35 ayes, 0 no, 0 absent, 0 excuse, House Bill 1038 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators Zenzinger, Crowder, Tate, Todd, Court, Bridges, Danielson, Priola, Woodward, Majority Leader, Winter, Gonzalez, Fields, Smallwood, Gardner, Rankin, Rodriguez, Donovan, Moreno, Patterson. Please add the President. Lundin. With a vote of 35 ayes, 0 no, 0 absent, and 0 excuse, House Bill 1069 is passed. <laughs> Co-sponsors. Senator Crowder, Senators Donovan, Tate, Todd, Winter, Janal, Williams, Court, Story. Third reading of bills, final passage. Mr. Carpenter, please read the title to House Bill 1172. House Bill 1172 by Representatives Weissman, also Senators Gardner and Cook, concerning an organization with codification of Title 12 called our revised statutes in connection with limiting substantive changes to those that conform similar provisions to achieve uniformly eliminate redundancy or allow for the consolidation of common provisions or the eliminate provisions that are archaic or obsolete. Senator Cook. Thank you, Mr. President. We move House Bill 1172 on third reading and final passage and ask for an I vote. Is there further discussion? Senator Gardner. 
Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chase, if you're listening, I told you it would uh, come to a third reading vote. And uh, we would be remiss if we did not thank the Office of Legislative Legal Services for what has been a three-year effort uh, in the recodification of Title 12, which, as everyone knows, is the most important bill of the session. We ask for an aye vote. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the passage of House Bill 1172 on third reading and final passage. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 35 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, and zero excused, House Bill 1172 is passed. Co-sponsors, the Minority Leader, Senators Lee, Crowder, Janal, Todd, Priola, Woodward, Tate, Lundeen. Mr. Carpenter, please read the title to Senate Bill 004. Senate Bill 4 by Senator Donovan, Representative Roberts, concerning measures to address the high cost of health insurance in the state and in connection with modifying the health care coverage cooperatives laws to include consumer protections and allow consumers to collectively negotiate rates directly with providers. Senator Donovan. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, colleagues. Um, just wanted to briefly perhaps begin on recapping yesterday. Um, just for um, cir circumstances beyond all of our controls, I know a lot of you weren't able to be in the chamber yesterday when we were working on this bill on, on second amendment, so on second reading, pardon me. Um, the bill, as if you will notice and look at the most recent version, has been changed um, quite significantly. Um, and it is focusing on the co-op formation uh, in the state to allow and empower individuals to form groups in order to negotiate directly with hospitals. Uh, we also amended it working with um, my colleague to make sure that we clarified the role of the commissioner in these co-ops going forward, um, as well as we um, changed the safety clause to a petition clause. So wanted to flag those important changes for the room now that we're all gathered back together. Um, but, but beyond that, let me go back further than just yesterday. Uh, healthcare has been something that I did not expect to work on. It was, it was an issue that was not a natural fit for me. I thought I was gonna come down here and pound my fist against the front range taking West Slope water be a voice for small-scale agriculture, talk about what it meant to be an educator, but then my district said, no, you need to work on healthcare. And so I walked in the building and started to try to work on healthcare. Um, it wasn't an issue that I had been exposed to except for when I went to visit my doctor or bought insurance. That was the breadth and depth of my experience. So for over, um, for over five years now, we've been coming up to the mic and in committees and saying, please help us lower the cost of health care for the individual market in the high country. And five years ago, that conversation was, my district is the highest priced district, not only in the state, but in the entire country. And year after year, different solutions were presented, different ideas were illuminated, um, we came at it from this angle, we came at it from this angle, and often those bills met their fate in committee. Um, the problem only got worse as we battled and presented a new idea with a new angle from a different approach. And so I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to have a bill on thirds in front of this body and ask you to support it today. Because as we saw those bills not make it to the governor's desk to sign, the problem only got worse. It didn't go stagnant, it didn't stay status quo, it only got worse. And what we also saw is it creeped out of the boundaries of Senate District 5 in the high country and now is touching every single one of our districts. I am sure you've heard that people, that the same stories that I've been hearing for years, you probably heard over the past couple years. So I sincerely ask for your support of this uh, one solution that we have in front of you that will have the power to take our vote and our support of policy and turn that into the ability of individuals across the state to join in a shared voice 
and go to their local health care provider and say, you must address the cost we are paying. We are speaking as one voice because we've been empowered by our General Assembly to do so. So I respectfully ask for your I vote on Senate Bill 4 on third reading and final passage, and I would also like to move Senate Bill 4 on third reading and final passage. Senate Bill, is there, Senator Bill 004 has been moved. Is there further discussion? Senator Smallwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, members. I um, just wanted to uh, briefly give my thoughts on, on this bill again, if you weren't around for second reading, um, to make sure that you know, obviously, you can vote however you want on this bill. I'm voting yes. This is a bill that's changed significantly since uh, before the Senate Health Committees. It's no longer a bill about creating a pilot program in uh, a very small area benefiting very few people. It's no longer a bill permitting the Division of Insurance to uh, form and administer co-ops. It's now a bill that, in my opinion, tries to modernize the rules around these health care cooperatives as well as, uh, according to testimony from the county commissioners in those areas, gets the state government out of the way in allowing the formation of these um, co-ops. So again, I'm going to be an I vote, appreciate all the work that the sponsors and the stakeholders have done in making this uh, a very good bill. So with that, um, I'll be an I vote. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the passage of Senate Bill 004 on third reading and final passage. Are there any no votes? Senator Lundeen. With a vote of 34 ayes, one no vote, zero absent, and zero excuse, Senate Bill 004 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators Crowder, Foote, Heisey, Sonnenberg, Danielson, Lee, Gardner, Bridges, Rodriguez, Story, Gonzalez, Priola, Todd, Zenzinger, Marble, Corum, Court, Majority Leader, Winter, the Minority Leader, Smallwood, Janal, Williams, Rankin, Tate, Scott, Patterson, Moreno. Please add the President. Mr. Carpenter, please read the title to Senate Bill 166. Senate Bill 166 by Senators Fields and Gardner and Representative Roberts concerning the post board revoking certification of a peace officer who was found to have made an untruthful statement and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Fields. Mr. President, we move Senate Bill 166 um, on third reading and final passage. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the passage of Senate Bill 166 on third reading and final passage. Are there any no votes? Senators Hill, Cook, Crowder, Woodward. With a vote of 31 ayes, four no votes, zero absent, zero excuse, Senate Bill 166 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senator Moreno, the Majority Leader. Mr. Carpenter, please read the title to Senate Bill 167. Senate Bill 167 by Senator Danielson and Representatives Exum and Durant concerning the creation of a Colorado Professional Firefighter's License plate in connection with making an appropriation. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Senate Bill 167 on third reading and final passage. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the passage of Senate Bill 167 on third reading and final passage. Are there any no votes? The Minority Leader, Senator Sonnenberg, Senator Marble. With a vote of 32 ayes, 3 no votes, 0 absent, and 0 excuse, Senate Bill 167 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators Priola, Tate, Todd, Story, Crowder, Foote, Bridges, Winter, Fields, Janal, Lee, Williams, Gardner, Moreno, Patterson. 
Please add the president. Mr. Carpenter, please read the title to House Bill 1150. House Bill 1150 by Representative Thomas Senator Danielson concerning the recreation of the Consumer Insurance Council as an advisory body to the Commissioner of Insurance. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move House Bill 1150 on third reading and final passage. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the passage of House Bill 1150 on third reading and final passage. Are there any no votes? Senators Hill, Sonnenberg, Lundeen. Marble, Woodward, with a vote of 30 ayes, 5 no votes, 0 absent, and 0 excuse, House Bill 1150 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senator Tate, Senator Moreno, Senators Patterson, Story, Janal, Donovan, Priola, Winter, Bridges, Rodriguez, Court. General order, second reading of bills. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of General Order's second reading of bills. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The motion is adopted and the Senate will resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for considerations of General Order's second reading of bills and Senator Zenzinger will take the chair. The committee will come to order and the coat rule is relaxed. Will the clerk please read the title to House, excuse me, Senate Bill 85. Senate Bill 85 by Senators Danielson and Pedersen, Representatives Buckner and Gonzalez Gutierrez, concerning the creation of the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act in order to implement measures to prevent pay disparities. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 85 and the Judiciary Committee report. To the report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, colleagues, for your time and attention today. We come to you with Senate Bill 85. And on to the Judiciary Committee report, it, it actually is significant today uh, to mention a few of the things that we accomplished in the measure. Uh, we worked extensively with opponents of the measure to um, make it more um, easy to implement. So. A, a broad range of business community representatives came to us with their ideas, um, higher education, et cetera. And some of them were great ideas that made the bill better, uh, strengthened the measure, and, um, and so we did. We amended the bill, I think, eight times in favor of a number of uh, pretty reasonable accommodations to uh, make it a bill that could be implemented by businesses all across the state. So with that, I urge an I vote on the Judiciary Committee report. Is there any? Senator Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just want to thank Senator Danielson. I know uh, you were working till uh, very late all out week with stakeholders and also members on the committee. Thank you for your feedback. And I think that the amendments make it a, a stronger bill and I ask for your support. Is there any further discussion on the report? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of the Judiciary Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the report is adopted. To the bill. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks again, uh, members and visitors in the chamber and gallery today. We bring you Senate Bill 85, the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act. I know a number of you have seen uh, my little daughter, Isabel, running around the chamber. And those of you who serve with me in the house uh, saw quite a lot of her. She'll be two soon, and she's got a lifetime of opportunity before her. But if Colorado does nothing to address 
gender pay disparities, then at the rate the gender wage gap is currently closing, Isabel will be a woman in her 40s by the time she makes what a man earns for doing the exact same job. That is unacceptable. I've been dedicated to the fight for equal pay for a long time now, but each day as Isabel grows, I become more inspired to keep up this fight for her and for all of Colorado's daughters. That's why I'm sponsoring Senate Bill 85 with Senator Pedersen and once again fighting to secure equal pay for equal work in Colorado. The facts of the gender pay gap are astonishing. White women in our state make 86 cents for every dollar men earn for the same exact work, according to the Women's Foundation of Colorado. The numbers are far worse for black women who make just 63 cents on the dollar and for Latinas who earn only 53.8 cents for every dollar a white man makes for the same exact job. Inequality in pay due to gender, uh, they jeopardize the financial securities that uh, Colorado families deserve. While 40 cents might not seem like a lot at first, these numbers add up exponentially. Over the course of a woman's lifetime, the average male will take home over half a million dollars more than the average woman, according to the National Committee on Pay Equity. This is a substantial amount of money that could go towards co college tuition, medical costs, retirement, maybe buying a home, providing necessary childcare for your little ones, and so much more. And with more and more women ever than ever before serving as the sole or co-breadwinners in families, this loss of income also hurts partners, children, and families. Paying women equi equitably for their work would lift families out of poverty as well as grow Colorado's economy by more than $9 billion. Not only is it the right thing to do, but we would literally add billions into the Colorado economy. The good news is that we have this new opportunity to close the gender wage gap. Senate Bill 85 would prohibit employers from asking prospective employees for their past wage rates and from relying on a prior wage rate to determine salary. It will also protect hardworking women throughout the state by preventing employer retaliation. Ensuring that women are not tied to their previous salaries can help break the cycle of wage discrimination. The bill requires employers to announce advancement opportunities and job openings to all employees, as well as disclose the pay range for these openings. So instead of hand-picked insiders being selected for jobs, the women get to decide whether or not they're qualified to apply. I'm proud to sponsor this common sense legislation with Senator Pedersen to end gender-based wage discrimination in Colorado. Isabel and all Colorado daughters deserve a future in which hard work, experience, education, not their gender, determine their earnings. It is time we deliver that future and give every Colorado worker equal pay for equal work. I urge and I vote on Senate Bill 85, the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act. Senator Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, before I talk about this bill, I just want to thank Senator Danielson for your leadership. Uh, you have been fighting this fight for years now. Really happy to be on this bill with you. Also want to thank Senator Winter, who has been a part of uh, pieces of this bill over the last few years, and Senator Donovan. Uh, while we can only have two sponsors, this is really a team effort, and we couldn't be here without you as well. Uh, this bill is incredibly important because it changes the conversation from the beginning. Instead of actually asking us what our salary history is and how, much, how little we can get paid for our future potential job, we are asked our salary requirement. That's what this bill will change. It will also ensure that the salary ranges are posted and opportunities for promotion are publicly posted as well. So what this means is that women will have leverage that they haven't previously had in Colorado. And then for the small percentage of bad actors, there are remedies in place of this bill where you can actually file suit and hold them accountable. But for most businesses, they actually don't realize that they have a system in place that perpetuates inequity. 
And that's why I think it's the other pieces of this bill that are so important, because it really changes the conversation and ensures that we have the opportunity to advocate for ourselves in ways that we haven't before. As a millennial, this bill is important to me. When I think about my lifetime earnings, on average will be $1 million less if we just go along with the status quo. If we do nothing in my lifetime, and for other millennial women, we will earn $1 million less. It's not because we don't have the education, the experience, the work ethic, or these specific positions. It's because we are paid less from the very beginning, and that follows us throughout our careers. So if we do nothing, I will also be 75 years old before women are actually paid the same as men. And I think that we can all agree that that is unacceptable uh, for future generations, that we can actually have a systematic change in Colorado to ensure that women have that same opportunity. As Senator Danielson mentioned, this will bring $9.2 billion a year back into Colorado's economy, just for women getting paid what their male colleagues do. So it will also ensure that women are self-sufficient and 50% less of women working in poverty. So this is an incredibly important bill. I believe that we will be able to look back in 10 years and point to what we were all able to do together in this chamber to make a difference for women in Colorado families. And I ask for your support. Is there any further discussion? Senator Woodward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, colleagues, I, I completely agree that equal pay for equal work is, is a laudable goal. It's how I practice my life and my business. Um, what I think the problem is is the way this bill has its, the teeth in this bill actually provides more full employment for attorneys instead of putting money in the hands of women and workers. So, so let me tell you a personal story first before I introduce uh, a couple of amendments that I think will help this. Uh, first of all, in my business, for the last 10 years, I have always um, paid women more. Women earn 27% more in my company, and they've always held the top leadership jobs. One of the pieces that this bill is going to backfire is that it, in fact, gives men the teeth then to step in and say, hey, employer, you are, you are paying women more for doing the same work. And it comes down to, I pick, and I think most employers pick, whoever will do the job the best, and that's who we want to pay well and who we want to reward. So I'm a complete supporter of, of this. But I think we're going about it a little bit wrong. One of the pieces that I think goes about it wrong is that it puts it takes away the role of the state. Currently, the director of the Department of Labor and Employment uh, the Labor Department here in Colorado takes all complaints, weighs those, and, and comes up with a fair uh, result. And if either party doesn't like the result, then it goes further beyond that through an appeals process. There is an amendment on the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment L036? Amendment L036, Assembly Lady Five, Senator Woodward. Amendment Senator printed. Woodward. Thank you, Madam Chair. What, what this amendment does is it basically strikes Section 5 and returns it back to the original language, which says the director of the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment has the right to make these decisions. So, so first, Madam Chair, let me move uh, Amendment L.036. Thank you. Now to the amendment. And again, what this amendment does is it returns the authority to make these decisions back to the governor's appointment. Uh, he will do a great job. I had a chance to meet with him, and, and I think he is a fighter for worker rights, and uh, it puts it back in his, in his hands so that we don't go immediately to court on these processes. So I urge an I vote on this amendment. Is there any other discussion on Amendment L036? Senator Danielson. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. There's a lot more to this amendment. I request the Senatorial 5 to read it. The Senate will uh, take a Senatorial 5. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I um, uh, thank you to my colleague for bringing forward this idea, but this actually um, gets at a major, major piece of the bill, which um, we've created a way for women to hold their employers accountable for the first time ever. And that if they feel so compelled, they can take an employer to court and uh, recoup some of the damages that have been lost over the years. Um, this eliminates the private right of action in the bill, and I ask for a no vote on Amendment L036. Is there any other discussion? Yes, Senator Gardner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, members, this is an excellent amendment. It is excellent because um, it restores the decision concerning litigation to the director of the Department of Labor and Employment. And what the bill does now, without the amendment, is it creates a private cause of action. Now, over the years, and I think you know that I make my living uh, as a, an attorney, some say a simple country lawyer, um, I don't make my living as a legislator. And this is one of those, those situations where I come down here and, and I have to tell you, the lawyer me, I, I want my friends over here to understand, the lawyer me thinks this is a really bad amendment. However, the person who represents small businesses in my district and the citizens of my district thinks this is an excellent opinion. Uh, this is a, a, an excellent amendment. Creating more and more private causes of action creates more litigation. It makes it much more difficult for small employers. It creates more employment for lawyers. If you're for more employment for lawyers, you'll want to vote no on this. But if you're for small business, you're going to want, want to vote yes on L036 because it restores balance to the system and some modicum of protection for our small businesses in Colorado. I ask for an I vote. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to add some context for those of you who didn't listen to the committee hearing here. Um, the Department of Labor has never seen one case through. The existing setup that would go back to its form if we pass this amendment would put it back to the status quo that is right now. It's an absolutely ineffective tool for women who have been wronged, who have been discriminated against in the workplace. And that is why we are giving them a new tool to hold their employers accountable. Like I said, this is an ineffective tool. It has never been utilized. And uh, again, for the folks who came to committee to testify in favor of this measure, um, can tell you time and time again that they need an actual quality tool to hold their employers accountable. 
And that is why you must vote no on this amendment. Thank you. Senator Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this brings us back to the status quo. Like I talked about before, I will be 75 years old before women are paid the same for doing the same job if we do nothing. So this is a unfriendly amendment because the small percentage of businesses that are bad actors, th there will be some accountability in place for women. But the most important piece is that we change the conversation from the beginning to ensure that we actually have the opportunity to advocate for ourselves and then if our employers have, are, have bad intentions, there's actually a mechanism for accountability. So I ask for your no vote on L036 because the status quo is not working. Senator Woodward. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also put this amendment on because I think it makes it easier for women to initiate a complaint. As written, the only way that you can go about enforcement, so if, if you're a woman who has a complaint, or in fact, perhaps a man who has a complaint about the wage uh, that you were given and saying it's unfair, the only thing that you can do is now go to district court and file a complaint. Currently, under current process, you can simply make a phone call to the Department of Labor and initiate a process. It's so much easier for women today to start a process, uh, and, and my amendment would restore that and make it easier for women to make a complaint. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, for the folks who weren't listening to the committee hearing, uh, we did highlight and amend the bill in order to very clearly highlight that a woman still has the opportunity to go through the um, Colorado Civil Rights Division and wage a complaint, that in no way is any woman required to go to court, that you can still wage a claim. It's just going to be through the CCRD and that you can even take the evidence that they find and demonstrate and take that to court if you wish. But no, there is in no way fewer options for women in this bill. We've expanded the ability that women have to hold their employers accountable if they so choose. So we have literally spelled it out in the bill that a woman is not required to go to court if she wants to hold her employers accountable. She may still wage a claim. It will still be investigated. It's just adding this opportunity for a woman for the first time ever in Colorado to take her employers to court if she has been discriminated against in the workplace. If you pass this amendment, you will strip that ability of the woman to hold her employers accountable. Like I said, we amended the bill to very clearly say that a woman still has the opportunity to go to the Colorado Civil Rights Division and in, is no, way, in no way is forced to go to court. Senator Gardner. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate the uh, explanation from the senator from Wheat Ridge, and I disagree with it in this sense. Uh, yes, uh, a woman always has and had before the right to go to the Colorado Civil Rights Division, uh, a complex process, a lengthy process. Currently, the law would allow a complaint to the director of the Colorado uh, Department of Labor and Employment. And have a very straightforward administrative proceeding if that was not resolved. CCRD would allow you to go to court as well, but this locks out the ability to go to the director of the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment, makes it more complex. My, my yardstick on this, as I've already given it to you, is that if the, if the lawyer me says, that's probably really good for all of us lawyers, then the legislator me says, that's not in the interest of my constituents because it creates more litigation. It does not resolve problems at their lowest possible level in the easiest fashion possible. This is an excellent amendment. I ask for an I vote on L036. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of L036. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The no's have it, and the amendment is lost. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of Senate Bill 85. All those in favor? Senator Lee. Thank you. I apologize, uh, Madam Chair. 
I wanted the uh, body to know that the Colorado Chamber is now neutral on this bill. Uh, when we heard this bill in the Judiciary Committee um, in January, they felt that there was a lot of work to do uh, from all sides prior to the hearing. And I want to commend the sponsor and the chamber for getting together. When the business community came up to talk about this bill, they all indicated that they were supportive of the concept of equal pay for equal work. As you know, in this chamber, the devil is in the details. They had challenges with some of the details in the bill. So we worked with these groups uh, and individual businesses for days. Uh, there was a lot of collaboration and partnership and we came up with a series of amendments. I believe there were like nine amendments that went on the bill in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, bills dealing with the uh, period of back pay that could be allowed for a claim. Uh, requirements regarding job posting were added, establishing that an employer is not subject to liquidated damages if they act in good faith. Uh, allowing some reasonable business exceptions to comparable pay for comparable work based upon geography, training, education, and experience, uh, clarifying that workers have the option to seek a claim in the Civil Rights Division, uh, and changing the effective date to postpone it for until uh, 2021 for businesses to adjust and to come into compliance. So based on these efforts, I'm authorized to say that the Colorado Chamber of Commerce and other businesses believe that the bill is a significant step forward and they are neutral on the bill. They are no longer opposing the bill based on the amendments that were put on it. Thank you. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to my colleague for mentioning that. It actually reminded me of a commitment that I made. Um, along the way, some of the amendments that we made were, like I said, it's just a broad range of businesses that are looking forward to implementing this measure. And um, one concern came from higher ed. Uh, we did amend the bill to accommodate some of their concerns. I think their concerns went a little farther than we were able to move the language. However, I'd like to just say to the record that we believe that the piece about um, Basically, what we've done is written in a lot of different scenarios for why women and men should be paid differently. Um, if you outperform someone, if your job is based on sales performance, if you have an accelerated degree, if you are published, if you work more hours, if you've worked more years, whatever seniority um, you may achieve, there are legitimate reasons that men and women should be paid different. And we've basically done what we can to say, all things being equal, if a woman is being discriminated in the workplace and can prove it, here we go. Um, we believe that the uh, exception that we made for education and experience would cover the, the concerns of academia and higher ed when it comes to um, their specific seniority concerns like being published or an accelerated degree. And so to that end, I just wanted to make mention there and thank them for their cooperation. Senator Crowder. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, there may be merit to this bill. You know, this might be, uh, we might be looking at this a little bit wrong, but what I would, I would encourage the sponsors and the people that are putting the amendments in to get together on this. This may very well be a workable bill. You know, but what I would like to see, is there anything in here that says if, a, if an individual brings suit against a business, and if that suit is found to be a, uh, non applicable, is there recourse for that business to recover the cost of their defense? Uh, that's one issue that I have. Uh, I, I, I think we can, you know, I, I think equal, equal pay is an issue that we ought to look at and address. You know, I, I'm not sure how, what the, you know, how many people are involved in this, but there's, if there's any involvement at all, it should be corrected. But I think that this may, you know, it may be something instead of uh, this side versus this side, I think it, maybe there is a way to come together and I would ask the sponsors to, to look at these amendments that they're putting on and to make sure that this is more equitable for everyone involved. Thank you. Senator Marble. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to address this bill and why I am a no vote and why I voted the way I did yesterday. I didn't go into this, but I have a research paper from Tanya Tarr, who herself is a minority woman, and did an excellent job of explaining why we have a recent study by the Institute for Women's Policy Research uh, and how it gained its information and why it was done methodically so bad. She has an incredible insight, in, and I am a total fan of Tanya Tarr, and she says, it's important to remember that statistics have no bearing on an individual's probability of success. Much of the historical or statistical analysis from the Institute of Women's Policy Research miss profound changes that have happened for working women in the last six years. Attempting to boil down the experience of millions of people and dozens of industries. In those industries, we're looking from construction, we're looking at oil and gas, field workers, to the people who work in tech. That's a big difference in uh, industry differences. And this is across multiple decades into a few numbers. So try, try, try and boil these down. It's actually very problematic because so much context and meaning is lost. It also misses more nuanced and contradictory dynamics that exist in smaller pockets of women in the workforce. Women and men of varying industry are all lumped together in their wage ratio. The Institute for Women's Policy Research Analysis also looks at intervals of 15 years with the first cohort starting with working women in 1968. Problematic, a problematic piece of the IWPR analysis is it doesn't properly weigh the massive changes that have happened for women and their earning potential in the last six years. The Pew Research reported that in 2012, 71% of women and only 61% of men attended college with a significant advantage or advancement by black and Hispanic women. This is incredible advancement and should be applauded by women. And we have done so much to be proud of. In 1963, there were only 38% of women enrolled in higher education. Consider that the women who started college in 2012 have only been in the workforce full time for two years at a maximum which would be in no way a measurement or a measurable impact on the Institute for Women's Policy Research findings. I think it's particularly interesting that it's true for women seeking to uh, enter the higher paying tech industry, whether in tech or other professional service industries, pay scale found in a recent study that the controlled gender pay gap was two cents. Two cents. The controlled gender pay gap is when women and men at a similar job compare salaries, which is specific to job description and industry. But many of these advances in pay are recent, may not have registered with the IWPR analysis. I'd like you all to take some time and go over this. Tanya Tarr is very, very remarkable in her way to pick apart the problems of us and our numbers and statistics. And yes, we can make numbers say anything, but I think her way of going about looking at our pay scales is remarkable, and that is why I am a no vote. Senator Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to some of the points that were just made, 
women are actually attaining degrees at a higher rate than men. And it, it clearly points to even how, how much more important this bill is because we are getting higher levels of education and we are still being paid differently and at a far less rate than men. So thank you for highlighting that. And to say that you know, we're not uh, accurately reflecting where we are with the pay gap, it would be wonderful to see that we are actually closing that pay gap quicker than we are projected. But we know when we look at our state data, it points at every level to support the evidence that we have brought forward and the bill that we're bringing forward as a solution. Women are paid significantly less for doing the same job, period. And if it's true that we were being paid and we were have a very small gap, then there should be nothing to fear with this bill because it ensures an evil, a level playing field for women to advocate for themselves and the private right of action we would never actually have to go file suit. So uh, we know that this bill is necessary, the status quo is not working, and I urge you to support this bill. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick point. Um, I appreciate the um, data that we heard earlier, but from the start of my presentation, what I said was in reference to the Women's Foundation of Colorado's uh, years-long studies that are a result of decades of work on um, the Women's Foundation of Colorado specific to the state. They're a well-trusted um, and well-respected 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, and the numbers that I gave are across the board, low-wage earners, CEOs, everybody in between. What they've done is taken account for every single comparable problem apart from a woman's gender, and whether or not she's a member of another protected class. And so the actual facts are that when compared to men across the state, white women earn at the top, at the top along with Asian women, white women earn 86 cents for every dollar to, the men, to, the, to men for the same work, the same work. So we're not talking about job descriptions, we're not talking about rates of college education, we're not talking about college attendance, we're talking about the same jobs all across the state, and yet, because a person happens to be female, she will, she will earn 80 cents, 86 cents to the dollar for every dollar a man, a man earns for the same exact work. And it only goes downhill from there if you happen to be GLBTQ, if you happen to be disabled, or if you happen to be a woman of color, and we alluded to that earlier by saying for the same exact jobs, day in, day out, week in, week out, year long, Latino women still only earn 54 cents to the dollar that a white man earns for the same exact work. Now is the time to stop that cycle of discrimination. And this is the tool that you've got in front of you to use. So thank you again, and I urge an I vote on the bill. Senator Fields. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the um, bill sponsors for bringing us Senate Bill 1, uh, Senate Bill 85. As I read the bill, it is very progressive, it's very timely, it's very thoughtful, and it's the time is right for us to be doing this right now. And I don't want us to get lost in translation as it relates to some of the statistics that you've been seeing and hearing. The fact is that women are underpaid. And if you go to the U.S. Department of Labor, they will show you occupations after occupation. You can be an accountant, you can be a physician, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer. And time and time again, it will show you the average of pay for that woman and average pay for a man, and you will see that women earn less. But let's talk about the reality of what's going on here in the state of Colorado. Because what we're seeing in, in the state of Colorado is more women are head of the household. More women are just working minimum wage, wages. And they're not able to make ends meet. I have a statistic here that says nine out of 10 single mothers of color with young children 
have income that's inadequate to cover the expenses that they need. We all know that the expenses that we have living in the state of Colorado is difficult. We need to address the wage gap in the state of Colorado. And what this, do, this bill does, it gives the opportunity to create transparency as it relates to income, giving an opportunity for women to take much more ownership to negotiate their wages. This bill is designed to shrink the wage gap and to create a state where there's equity in pay for all employees, men and women. So this is about doing the right thing, and I do urge a yes vote on Senate Bill 85. Senator Court. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, how many of you remember reading not too long ago about the lawsuit from the DU law professors, the female DU law professors. Many of you read that article and followed that case. These are sophisticated, educated women, the DU law professors that are female, who brought and won a pay discrimination case against the University of Denver. Would we expect to see that if women were not being paid in, uh, unequally, that wouldn't have happened. But even in a place as sophisticated as the University of Denver and the law school there, women were discriminated against and had to bring a lawsuit to get the equal pay they deserved. And folks, some of those women are my constituents, and I'm very proud of them for pointing out the inequity that they had to live with for many, many years. This is the right thing to do for everyone, not just women, but men too. So they recognize that their coworkers are being treated respectfully and fairly. I urge a yes vote. Senator Crowder. Well, that's my point. The previous speaker made, uh, there was a lawsuit. So my question is, why do we need to change the system if it's working like it is? And why can't we, well, don't laugh, but why can't we make this more equitable for everybody? Why is there a division because of this bill? And that's, that's all I'm saying. Are we protecting businesses in case of a bad lawsuit? So is this something we can work out and make it a very uh, a valuable bill for all of us? Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of Senate Bill 85. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. The ayes have it, and the bill is adopted. Majority Leader Fenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the committee rise and report. The motion before the body is for the committee to rise and report. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the committee will rise and report. The Senate will come back to order. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. The committee has met and had a bill under consideration. Will the clerk please read the report? Mr. President, your committee will legal report is adding consideration the following attached bills being seconded in the open makes following recommendations are on. Senate Bill 85 has been passed and order gross place counter for the ring final passage. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the adoption of the report. The motion is for the adoption of the committee whole report. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please amendment 001 to the committee the whole report? The whole amendment 001, Senate Bill 85, Senator Woodward moved to amend the report of the committee whole. So the following. Senator Woodward. Mr. President, thank you. I move uh, committee the whole report uh, amendment uh, 001. To the amendment, Senator. 
Thank you, Mr. President. We discussed the importance of, if you recall, we discussed the importance of making it easy for women to file a complaint directly with CDLE. This amendment removed the requirement that women must hire an attorney and file an expensive, complicated lawsuit in district court. Vote yes on this amendment so that women can take action against bad actor employers. Is there further discussion? Senator Danielson. Thank you, Mr. President. I urge a no vote. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. President. This amendment, uh, we had a good discussion on it during the uh, Committee of the Whole. What this amendment does is restores the current system that doesn't create a new cause of action, the need to hire a lawyer, litigation, that is unnecessary to vindicate the rights of employees. It's full employment for lawyers, not employers. It's important that we not create more and more causes of action so that really the employees are caught in the middle in order to get what they are entitled to and rather than getting the director of CDLE to act for them and to have their hearing now they have to go to court or they have to go to CCRD and go through a very long process. This Committee of the Whole Amendment will ensure they don't have to do that. It is employee friendly. I ask for an I vote. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the question before the body is the adoption of Amendment 001 to the Committee of the Whole Report. Are there any no votes? Senators Danielson, Rodriguez, Gonzalez, the Majority Leader, Winter, Court, Williams, Foote, Fields, Pedersen, Lee, Donovan, Moreno, Janal, Bridges, Zenzinger, Todd, Story. Please add the President. With a vote of 16 ayes, 19 no votes, zero absent and zero excuse, that amendment is lost. The question before the body is the adoption of the committee of the whole report. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 35 ayes, zero no, zero absent and zero excuse, the committee of the whole report is adopted. Senate Bill 085 is amended, passed on second reading, ordered and grossed and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Consideration of House amendments to Senate bills. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 181? Senate Bill 181 by Senator Svenberg and Foot and Representatives Becker and Carve concerning additional public welfare protections regarding the conduct of oil and gas operations in connection with making an appropriation. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 181. Mr. Majority Leader, please tell us why the Senate should concur with House amendments. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, members, uh, there were, uh, as, as we know, this, there was a robust debate here in the Senate. Uh, this bill went through several committees, was amended every step of the way, uh, and then the same occurred over in the House. And the bill went through several committees, uh, had a very robust debate um, on the floor as well. And there were, I believe, 14 amendments made to um, the House. And I think it is in the best interest of our state, uh, the best interest for this body, uh, and in the best interests of the communities that are impacted by oil and gas extraction as well as the communities that have uh, oil and gas extraction uh, industry um, that supports their economies um, for us to accept these amendments, uh, call it um, a job well done, and make sure that um, we can move forward with some certainty uh, and ensure that um, there are some basic health and safety protections uh, for all folks around the state of Colorado. And I'm happy to speak more to the amendments uh, as we get into the discussion. Is there further discussion? Senator Hill. 
Thank you, Mr. Pre President. Now, colleagues, just want to confirm we had a long discussion, I think, about a lot of aspects of this bill. I, we know there was some significant disagreements over this bill, but all along it's been said this was not intended to be a ban. This wasn't going to be a ban. This was about safety and, and not about a ban. We talked about that here at the microphone in the Senate, um, and, and it seems that in some ways these amendments were intended to address that. I wonder if the uh, sponsors, Mr. President, would be willing to address whether or not this alleviates some of the concern that Senate Bill 181 actually permitted bans on uh, development of our oil and gas resources. Is there further discussion? Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think many of us uh, heard uh, that this bill is a potentially de facto ban. I think many of us heard uh, that this would um, stop the industry overnight. Uh, the amendments, I would say, did not change the fact that that was never true to begin with. Uh, this, I've heard from the industry um, that they would like us to concur uh, with the House amendments. Um, I don't think they would be asking us to do that if they thought this would truly end the industry overnight and create a statewide ban or even local bans. Um, that is not what the bill did as introduced. Uh, that is not what the bill does now as amended. Um, I believe there, are, there were um, some, some additions in the House um, that provided some safeguards to make people feel more comfortable that in fact that's not what the bill does or what it could do. Um, but I still hold pretty staunchly to the fact that it never did that in the first place and therefore um, there's very little we could have done uh, to ensure that it didn't occur because it wouldn't have occurred in the first place in the introduced bill. Um, this bill does, again, if you remember back to our debate, does allow uh, in the interim before the health and safety rulemaking is officially adopted it does provide um, the ability to do additional research into permits that potentially uh, provide a health and safety risk to a community or to people. Um, that is still in there. Uh, we clarified the intention of that. Um, my understanding is that the industry doesn't think it's a potential moratorium or a ban, um, even though that was in some of the talking points. Uh, and um, we also clarified that the role of the local government at the local level um, is to have reasonable regulations when it comes to siting of oil and gas facilities. It does not give them blanket authority to do things like a ban or a uh, long-term moratorium that is effectively a ban. The bill never did that. However, I do think some of the amendments clarified that the intention wasn't that in the first place and the bill cannot be used for those types of purposes. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 181. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 35 ayes, 0 noes, 0 absent, 0 excuse, that motion is adopted. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the repassage of Senate Bill 181. Is there further discussion? Senator Foote. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, colleagues, since the passage of Senate Bill 181 out of the Senate and its debate and amendments in the House, a question has repeatedly come up about the, quote, necessary and reasonable standard language that we added in the Senate. There have been several requests uh, to further define it, but unfortunately that's proved to be difficult. I will say, though, that it's the sponsor's intent to have that phrase interpreted together and in the context of the bill as a whole, which is, one, a clear desire to prioritize health and safety when it comes to oil and gas operations, permitting and supervision without consideration of profitability from the state regulatory authority, the COGCC, and two, an ability for local governments to do the same and be more protective than the state if they choose. Necessary and reasonable is not intended to mean regulatory authorities can only make a land use decision or enact a regulation once all other options are exhausted. Instead, it is meant to be a guardrail against a regulatory or land use decision without reasonable justification. State and local governments should not be able to impose requirements, limitations, or decisions that defy explanation. However, they should be entitled to deference and allowed to use the precautionary principle to determine if a regulation 
where a land use decision is necessary and reasonable. Each locality's application of necessary and reasonable may be different depending on its circumstances and should be examined on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Mr. President. Is there further discussion? Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to say a couple of quick things uh, about how much went into this bill, uh, about how much input there was before it was introduced, but especially once it was out there and went through the process. Um, I printed off um, the list of the amendments that were adopted. Uh, there, throughout the process, I, I believe, if I counted correctly, um, there were 34 amendments that were put into this bill since it was introduced. Uh, that's quite a few amendments. Um, and some of them are technical in nature. Some of them are clarifying some unintended uh, potential consequences of the original language. Many of them were at the request of industry. In fact, I think um, some of the most major concerns that industry had uh, in, in many ways were addressed in one way or another. Um, and to say that this did not receive a robust debate and have its time throughout the process uh, for full debate and input, I think would be incorrect. I, I don't know how many amendments were offered in total, but the last one that was adopted, so there are probably more after this, is L-180. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen an L-180 before. Um, that's a lot of uh, offered amendments. Um, a lot of work went into this bill. It is not a perfect bill. Uh, it is not perfect for communities that want additional tools. It is not perfect for environmental advocates. It is not perfect for families that feel threatened, and it's not perfect uh, for the industry. But I do think it represents um, a sitting down of various diverse stakeholders to figure out what is the best path forward. Not can we solve every problem in one bill, but how can we move forward in a way that provides some certainty for communities, uh, for local governments, for families, for industry alike. And I think that's what this bill does. Uh, I want to speak to one uh, amendment in particular, particular that was adopted in the House. And uh, that is an amendment that uh, professionalized the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. This is um, something that the industry was asking for all along the way. Uh, we, uh, frankly, I was always kind of agnostic to whether the, the commission itself should be a professional body that has paid employees. My feeling when we were debating this in the Senate was that maybe we should not do all of this all at once. We should figure out how these rules get implemented, figure out uh, what the commission is going to actually need to be successful in this new world, uh, and decide in a year or two what those structural changes should be, including professionalizing the commission. That was an amendment that we adopted here in the Senate. Um, the House, uh, in further conversations with the industry, agreed to go further and actually take that step. And so this bill now, Senate Bill 181, uh, when adopted and when signed into law, will start the process of professionalizing the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. I don't think any of us know truly what that will look like. If it will look like the PUC and operate like the PUC, some would say, God, I hope not. Some would say, that sounds great. Um, but uh, that is a major concession, a major compromise that was made with the industry, was to, to say, yes, let's do this. If we, are, if we are trying to be honest about what we are trying to accomplish, including certainty, let's do this because the industry wants it. We think it overall can be a good thing to professionalize the commission and make sure that they are uh, on, on a regular basis meeting, that they are meeting efficiently, and that they have a professional way of conduct of evaluating the cases that they evaluate. Um, and so I, I support that. I think it's important that we move forward with this bill as is. Um, there will be tweaks in the future, um, I'm sure. Uh, but um, I think those will be uh, making some changes around the edges rather than wholesale um, changes to the overall framework like we are doing in this bill. I do hope that there is a recognition out there in the community, in all of the communities around the state that have been paying attention to this bill, that the things that the industry were asking for, especially professionalizing the commission, are in this bill. There are ballot measures filed out there, from what I hear, that would professionalize the commission. That is being taken care of. 
And I hope folks will realize that the best thing we can do moving forward now is to see this through, to go through the rulemaking process, to be engaged, and allow this to be successful and see what changes maybe need to happen in the future. But that the objectives of those ballot measures that are filed out there, a huge part of the objective of professionalizing the commission will be adopted and codified in law under this bill. And so I see that those are unnecessary and only provide more uncertainty for the industry and for families moving forward. And that is exactly what we do not need. Um, but with that, Mr. President, um, I think we have had a long, robust debate uh, over this bill, and I urge uh, an I vote for repassage. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the repassage of Senate Bill 181. Are there any no votes? Senators Hill, Marble, Corum, the Minority Leader, Cook, Sonnenberg, Heisey, Crowder, Lundin, Priola, Rankin, Scott, Woodward, Gardner, Smallwood, Tate. With a vote of 19 ayes, 16 no votes, zero absent, and zero excuse, Senate Bill 181 is repassed. Co-sponsors. Senators Story, Winter, Court, Gonzalez. Message from the House. House is passed on third reading of the Senate Bill that requires the statute of the House Bill 1167-1244 amendments from the House Journal April 2nd, 2019. House is passed on third and returns here with Senate Bill 203. Message from the Reviser. We hear with transmit without comment as the House Bill 1167-1244. Signing of bills. The President has signed House Bill 1052. Announcements. Senator Donovan. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I have um, spoken to the majority leader and the minority leader, and I ask to be excused on Monday. The what? Senator Donovan will be excused as requested. Senator Todd. Thank you, Mr. President. So if you're feeling a little stressed, you can relax, refresh, and renew with the Colorado Coalition of Massage Therapists are here this week, um, today, from 8.30 this morning till 2 in, um, on the first floor, Colorado State Capitol, first floor. And so complimentary chair massage, so take advantage of that and ease up. Thank you. Senator Fields. Mr. President, I, ha I do have an announcement. The uh, Senate Health and Human Services meet will meet upon adjournment, and we will be meeting in 25 minutes from now. Other announcements? Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, you probably know by now I, I love history, and one of the significant events in the history of our nation occurred on Monday, April 3rd, 1865, when General Ulysses S. Grant and his army entered the fallen capital of Richmond, Virginia. Six days later, on April 9th, General Lee would surrender to General Grant and those four years of bloody conflict in our nation would come to an end. Just ask that you keep um, our history in your thoughts this amazing month of April, and um, just an honor and privilege to work with all of you um, here in the Senate. Thank you, Mr. President. Further announcements. Senator Fields. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I would like to request a moment of personal privilege. Granted. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, yesterday I was notified that a very dear friend and community activist and advocate for criminal justice, I would call her a foot soldier, got her wings yesterday. She's in heaven right now, and her name is Tammy Garnett Williams. 
For anyone who has served down here and who has participated in any of our judiciary committees have probably most likely met her. I consider her a friend. I consider her a champion. And she's worthy of our time and attention. She never was shy about coming down here to share her thoughts and opinions as it related to criminal justice reform issues. She was active in our community. She was active in her church. She played a role with the NAACP and the Urban League. If there's anything social that's going on in the community as it, as it dealt with dealing with the most vulnerable people in our community, she was there. She told her personal story, and then she also told the story of the community that she loved to support. I consider her a friend of the state capitol because you could always count on her as her role as a citizen to share and lend voice. She um, was attending uh, Metro State College. She was working on getting her degree. She had great promise. She had a great future. And she's no longer with us. And so I would like to request a moment of silence, Mr. President, but I'm not quite sure who else might want to share their experience with Ms. Um, Tammy Garnett Williams. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to add my uh, thanks to the words spoken by the Senator from Aurora for recognizing Tammy Garrett Williams. I got to know her out in the world. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, she was part of the NAACP, an organization I've been a member of for many years. But what was really significant about her was that she showed up. She was at events, she was at rallies, she was at uh, Judiciary Committee hearings. She articulated her own uh, message of her own life. So she brought the life experience of a person who understood the criminal justice system from the inside out. Uh, her experience and her testimony has informed some of the legislation passed by this body. So I honor Tammy Garrett Williams for the work that she has done. Thank you. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Tammy actually uh, lived in my district for a while, and um, she came down to this body and sat on the bench um, over there several times, including twice this session. And um, it was a real shock. Um, the context in which she came down the last time was to talk about women's issues. Um, she was at the women's uh, lobby breakfast in the morning and she uh, told me how excited she was to be down here and to be on the floor and to have an opportunity to chat with um, me um, as her representative and uh, this body about an issue that she cared very deeply about. And the thing that touched me the most is we were there at breakfast, I was picking up my coffee and she said a little prayer for me. And it was extremely touching and um, we're going to miss her. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, as requested, the Senate will observe a moment of silence and the Senate chimes will be rung. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Seeing no further announcements, Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate recess until 2 p.m. today. You've heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have, and the Senate will stand in a recess until 1400 today.